How many people in this place believe in the name of Jesus? After three, we are going to shout the name of Jesus as loud as we can. One, two, three. Jesus! Come on, let's do it again. Jesus! We thank you, Lord. Now give him an applause that's worthy of his name. We praise you, Jesus, in this place. Woo! Thank you. Amen. You can be seated. Fantastic. Well, it is an honor, as we've already said, to have Pastor Thomas and Pastor Katrina with us this morning. And um, it's been wonderful over a number of years now um, to have a great friendship with this couple. They have uh, spoke into our lives and, and really helped us on our journey and always brought encouragement and timely words. You know, it's easy to speak a lot of things, isn't it? But there are, t there are people that I'm sure we all have in our lives that speak timely words at critical moments in our lives. And Thomas has been this person, and Katrina, to uh, Faye and I. And Thomas came, I think it was um, not last year, the year before. And again, an awesome, awesome word. And I just believe, you know, the Holy Spirit, this is a real significant day today. Thomas is going to minister um, to us. Okay, he's going to minister. He's going to, it's not just going to be hearing words, but he's going he's gonna to put things into your heart today that are going to bring great blessing in our future. I really believe that. And I just think the Holy Spirit spoke to me today about, about Thomas and about what Thomas is going to do in our hearts, in all of our hearts today. There's a, and it was just through a little verse in Proverbs. I think it's Proverbs 10. It says this, the mouth of a righteous man is a well of life, a well of life. Let me tell you something now. Life is not out there, friends, in the world. It's, it's a dark world. Life is in a righteous man. And he's going to speak to us this morning as a righteous man. And God's, I'm telling you now, from the wellspring of his spirit, from the wellspring of his life, we are going to drink. And we are going to be, some of us are going to be refreshed, going to be healed. We're going to be delivered. And there's so many things that we are going to take, even things that the presence of the Lord is just going to minister. And he's going to go with what, what is on his heart. And God is just going to distribute the bread for whatever you need. Amen. Are you up for that? Just from the wellspring of his spirit this morning, let's, let's drink because we're really, how many people are thirsty? I'm really thirsty. I'm telling you now, I'm really thirsty and we're going to drink this morning. So let's honor Pastor Thomas as he comes this morning. Come on church, let's honor this man of God in our midst. Thank, Bless you. You, Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you for those very generous words. And I can tell you, you have the best pastors in, on this planet, Dave and Faye. We love them, and they are amazing. And uh, just before you applaud them, I'll tell you that they, they came to our leadership conference the last time. And they just really blessed and, uh, and gave into our church. And Faye, she had a session for in our leadership conference, hundreds of people. And she had one of the most impacting sessions in the whole conference. She did so good, and this was so honor them and applaud them. We love you. <laughs> and uh, we have many things in common. Uh, we have, uh, you know, been through transitions in our churches. And uh, I'm, uh, you know, the help and the blessing has really been mutual, you know. It's not something that only goes one way. But I've been, uh, I've been really excited about this time uh, because... Uh, and there's one particular reason, and that is to be able to congratulate you with your amazing, supernatural semi-final achievement in the Euro 16. What was that? That's amazing. That's one thing we don't have in common, a great national football team. That was amazing. So we were actually lots of Norwegians where we're going for Wales. They became our replacement national team for those few days. Uh, Iceland as well, but also Wales, definitely. So, uh, so we were really, 
really excited about that. But and now uh, actually we have one more thing in common, but I'm I'm not sure I should mention it. It's that now we're we're two countries outside the EU. But uh, maybe I shouldn't just. <laughs> well, I'm not. Yeah, I know. You know, that could go both ways if I mention that. So I will not mention it. But you know, I uh, I'm really excited. I'm thankful to be here, and I also want to give uh, just. Uh, just a quickly honor to, uh, to Pastor Ray, who has been to our church many, many times. And he was with us this summer even for our summer festival. And I just has to have to testify from the excitement of my heart because our summer festival is really uh, focused towards reaching new people. So it's not a church conference. It's really geared towards the community and speaking to people who don't know Jesus. And Pastor Ray, he would be the best person to do that. So he did absolutely awesome. People responded to Christ. And uh, in the daytime, we have, our, we have like a kids festival, uh, four to 12 years. And we had a record uh, attendance this year with 850 kids. And the majority, or at least up till maybe 40% from unchurched families in the community. And we have lots of fun activities, crazy stuff, but also we preach Jesus loud and clear, and we, we're not ashamed of the gospel, and we just saw tremendous things. And with Ray in the house as well. So thanks for everything you've invested into our church throughout the years, and uh, I'm sure the best is yet to come, right? So this morning, um, I, really, I really have, and actually those who hear, my, hear me preach, they know that I'm, I don't say this every Sunday, but I have a word for you this morning. <laughs> You know, I really believe, and uh, it's, uh, it's a message I hope will bless everyone, but maybe it's particularly for someone. Um, it's for those of you who are pulled in different directions by different voices, different influences. When you hear about people who's hearing voices, then you think it's something strange going on. Oh, I hear voices. But the fact is that we all hear voices all the time. We're exposed to different sources of influence. And in this age, we are exposed to more information. We're exposed to more voices. We're exposed to more influence, opinions, messages coming in all the time. Now, for some of you, even during the four minutes I've spoken, you've already checked your phone and you've gotten information. You checked your timeline on Facebook. You checked your Instagram. And that's okay. You can do that in church. If you take a picture of me and write great preaching, then you can... Be on Instagram. No, we, we're, being, we're being overwhelmed with information and influence. So we're hearing voices. Um, in my life, there's many voices. There's many influences from the world, from society, from people, from friends, from my wife. She's here. She's one of the best voices. And she's, she's not just a great influence during the day. She speaks to me at night. You know, some people, they hear God speaking at night. I hear my voice, because she, her voice, because she's sleep talking. And actually... Sometimes it's really fun because she's giving instructions in, in her sleep. So she goes like, she, Thomas, you can put half over there and the other half over there. Okay. And, I, and she goes back to sleep. <laughs> so she explains stuff and I, I'll take the instructions in my sleep. But I, d I really believe that uh, this statement is, uh, is true. That one of the most crucial things in our life with God, with people, with Jesus... It's actually to decide which voices do you give authority to and which voices do you allow to determine your destiny and your thinking and your future. You know, there are voices in our lives and sometimes maybe one voice particularly that represents the highest authority in our life. There are voices we give weight to because we have voices all the time, but there are certain people. For some, it might be as simple as maybe your mom. Seriously, <laughs> you, you know, you have different voices. You have your pastors, you have your friends. But for some, maybe, especially even if there's an unhealthy re relationship, there might be family members, there might be p people in your life. And that one voice means so much. Their voice gives, uh, is something that you give authority to. And maybe you have heard this statement and heard preaching and messages on the, on the verse that says, as a man thinks, so he is. Amen. I believe that is totally true. Our thinking de determines our future. But what determines your thinking? Well, what you think is determined by what you hear. So the thinking is really crucial and important, but your thinking is controlled by the message you listen to. 
So I believe even more important than the mind is actually your ears. Because the message you take in will determine your thoughts and your thinking will then determine the ways and the paths of your life. So I believe that in all, in all these uh, spheres of influence, I really believe there is the voice of God in your life. I believe God speaks more to us maybe than we even realize. And you know, after uh, for some of us who've been to Hillsong Conference this week, we're really excited, we're really pumped up, and we, it feels honestly, Pastor Dave and Faye, as if we've been hearing God's voice for several days. And you sit, you listen to these preachers and these, you know, world-class communicators, and you think about your own message on Sunday, and you go, oh, how am I going to... No, we, we don't compare, but you feel like you, you've been hearing God's voice for several days. But then sometimes, when you come back after conference, there's something called post-traumatic conference syndrome. <laughs> you know, you've been hearing God's voice, and then you get just, you're just being, you land really hard back into reality. And there come some other voices immediately often the very first day or maybe even on the second day maybe for some of you who attended this amazing conference on the presence of God these days maybe even the few hours you've been home you've been exposed to immediate voices trying to steal the seed that has been sown into you I have a message for anyone who's being pulled in different directions and my text this morning is actually out of Mark chapter 6 and verse 14 to 29 but we will not read the whole thing um, I'm going to tell you what, what we're going to do, because uh, we're going to watch a film. Um, the story is about King Herod and John the Baptist. Okay? <laughs> no, not yet. Wait, wait a second. It's about King Herod and John the Baptist. And it's a great example of someone who's being pulled in different direction. And uh, King Herod is being influenced by the voice of God through John the Baptist, but also other voices. Herod was the governor of Galilee. And he had these personal conversations with John the Baptist. Let's read verse 20 before we watch the film, because this is the key verse. In verse 20, it says, Because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, listen to this, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. That's cute. It's like my daughter Sophia, when, when you film her with, your, with the camera, you know, you say, hey, Sophia, say hello to the camera. She goes, oh, no, 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 don't film me. Just a little bit. She wants to be filmed, but she doesn't want to be filmed. And it's like Herod, he loves to listen to John. There's something that puzzles him, something he's curious about, something that works on his heart, something that is being sown into him. Something that makes him more hungry for it. You can read the text and see he wants more. He's, he wants to listen more. But on the other hand, the text actually in uh, other translations says that he was confused. He was puzzled. He was perplexed. And I have a message for those who maybe are in that same situation. As a pastor, I meet lots of people in that situation. And let's watch the movie. And this is actually going to go for four minutes. And it's the whole story. It's the whole text with a little bit of historical context too. It's in Norwegian, <laughs> but it's subtitled with English. So let's have a look at Mark. This is the world premiere of this film in Wales. Mark 6, chapter, um, chapter 6, verse 14 to 29. Let's go. This is Kong Herodes Antipas, actually just a landsfyrste. Men ok, han er landsfyrste i Galilea og i Perea. Mektig og autoritær, men også en populist og redd for å bli mislikt. Sårbar og vaklende. Dette er Filip, broren til Herodes. Faren deres, Herodes den Store, hadde 15 barn med 10 ulike koner. Dette er Herodias. Hun var gift med Filip, men de ble skilt. Og hun gifte seg i stedet med broren, Herodes Antipas. Faktum er at Herodias var både nise og halvfigerinne til Herodes. For jødene var dette skikkelig fyrfyr. Folket likte det ikke. Dette er døperen Johannes. Han var ikke spesielt nervøs. 
Han utfordrer Herodes direkte og personlig på hans valg. Dette er ikke greit. Dette gjør Herodias pottesur, og hun blir såret, bitter og hevnlysten på Johannes. Johannes døperen og Herodes har flere personlige samtaler. Herodes lytter, men det er tydelig at han dras i to ulike retninger. Han blir forvirret og usikker av samtalene, men likevel ønsker han å høre på. Han som kommer etter meg er han som alt handler om. Han har kommet for å slette verden sin, også dine, Herodes. Nå er det jeg som er landsfyrste her, da. Så jeg slipper som regel unna med de fleste synder. Men han som kommer er kongenes konge. Til og med du tar et ansvar for han, Herodes. Han kommer til å ta alle dine synder på seg, og så bærer han straffen på deg. Ok, jeg tror det er halve for i dag. Herodes arrangerer så et stort bursdagsselskap der alle samfunnstoppene var samlet. Dette var et realt snobbeselskap. Militærledere, adelsmenn og finanseliten. Salome, tenåringsdatteren til Herodias, altså stedatter til Herodes. Hun danser i selskapet, og alle blir fullstendig betatt. Du, Salome, du kan ønske deg akkurat hva du vil. Hva som helst, så lover jeg at jeg vil oppfylle det. Kors på halsen. Hva som helst. Helt opp til halve kongeriket kan du ønske deg. Ja. Salome går til moren sin, Herodias, og spør hva hun skal ønske seg. Moren ser umiddelbart muligheten og visker til henne. Kom igjen. Ønsk deg døperen Johannes sitt hode. Hva? Er det litt selv? Ja. Jeg kommer aldri til å glemme det hvis du gjør dette for meg. Hva? Det er ganske sykt da. Det er bare fordi du ikke vet hvilken idiot Johannes er. Tro meg, du kommer ikke til å angre. Salome bykser tilbake til Herodes og sier klart og tydelig. Jeg vil at du nå, med en eneste gang, gir meg Johannes døperen sitt hode på et fat. Herodes svelger tungt, svetter og stammer litt. Han tar dette tungt, men han nekter å miste ansikt foran hele snobbeselskapet. Han sverget med ed at han skulle gjøre det. Han sender bødlen av gårde med bestillingen. Han kommer tilbake med Johannes sitt hode på et fat. All right, so the, the thing is, I asked my brother-in-law just a couple of weeks ago. I said, I'm, I'm going to preach on this text. And I asked, could you make an, an animation of the, of, the, of the text? And this is what he made in, in just one week. So thank you to my brother-in-law for a great... <laughs> so it's just the text. Is, you can read it uh, by yourself when you get home. But it's, uh, you know, it's uh, many people and details. But I love this story because Herod, what's special about him is that he's very different from many of the other people in the gospel. Because very often Jesus reached out to the blind, to the poor, to the weak, to the outcasts. But Herod, you know, he's a little bit more, I mean, he's a king, but he, he reminds me a little bit more of a modern man. I mean, he's got his freedom. He's got his, you know, options in life. He's got, you know, a certain level of authority. He's got a certain level of influence and money. And he's got, but his life is full of drama. It's full of problems. His history is full of violence, full of conflict, full of divorces, full of problems, full of all this stuff. It's a little bit like, I think actually some people can identify them a little bit with Herod. You know, in our lives, for me and Katrina, we're sometimes being puzzled by the voice of God. And maybe I told a little bit last time, but uh, four years ago, we were, uh, you know, my dad has, uh, he founded our church in 1985. And a little bit more than four years ago, actually now six years ago or something, he asked and really, um, really gave us the opportunity to take over leadership of the church. And uh, it was, it's a long story, I will make it very short, but we really felt that in this season there was something in the voice of God but you know we were really really puzzled we were perplexed we were pulled in two different directions because on the one hand there was there was the voice of God in this but on the other hand there were so many other voices and we were so confused it was a really hard season because we really weren't sure that this was for us we did not have peace with it actually when I saw my church I saw a scary monster coming towards me. 
actually in my mind, and this is not the truth, but in my mind when the church came, when I saw the church that I was asked to take over, then I saw in my head it looked like Jabba the Hutt of Star Wars. I think we have a picture. Have you seen him? You know, Jabba the Hutt, the, this slimy monster. Yeah, there is. That's how I looked at my church. And this is not how my church looks at all. Let's get him away. He's distracting us. But you know, sometimes I wish God's voice would be so loud and so clear and so direct that he would almost force us. But you know, that's not always how it is. God's voice is sometimes gentle. It's a little bit discreet. I mean, it's clear. It's audible. But it's discreet. It's whispering. It's, it's a voice that influencing, influencing you. And sometimes it's hard because you, you got so many other voices in your life. But you know, God loves to have the initiative in having influence, in, in reaching people. He loves to reach the doubters, you know. I will, I will bring you through three points, three different voices in Herod's lives and in our lives that are influencing us. And the first one is an old belief system versus a new belief system. Now I will explain what I mean. Because Herod, he had a history full of violence, intrigues. If you read the family history of the Herod dynasty, <laughs> it's, a, it's like a drama series. You know, it's like, I don't know what's the name of the, we have some Norwegian drama series where there's every new episode, there's new conflicts, there's new love relationships, there, there's new betray, betrayals. You can make a reality show out of the family of Herod. And you know, then John comes with a message. And just be assured that, if you wonder what did John share with Herod, well, he shared the gospel. Because you, could, you, you get the hint by listening to what did John the Baptist usually talk about. Well, he always pointed to Jesus. He said, there comes there some, there come someone greater than me. I must decrease, he will increase. And he says, there goes the Lamb uh, of God that carries the sins of the world. So John the Baptist, he was an evangelist always pointing to Jesus. So John the Baptist comes to Herod pointing to Jesus challenging his whole belief system. And you know what? Sometimes you've grown up with one way of thinking. You've grown up with one voice. Maybe you've grown up with the voice from your parents. You've grown up with the voice of religion. You've grown up with the voice of a certain way of thinking. Maybe from your group, maybe, maybe from your workplace. And for some, when God's voice comes in, it challenges your whole belief system. It's like it's almost humiliating. Isn't it? When you've known something, you've, spe you've spoken loudly about something for 25 years. This has been my opinions. This has been my viewpoints. This has been my statements. And then God's voice comes and changes all that. And basically says, oh, you've, been, you've been wrong all the time. You know, it's humiliating, isn't it? Be honest. It is. Even as a pastor and as a Christian, maybe you've been preaching one thing for 20 years. And suddenly you see in scripture, wow. I I'm not saying that everything is everything you've done is useless but sometimes you just do these discoveries that you're almost humbled it's like wow this this is a little bit different and you know it's humiliating it's hard but i want you to know one thing that when the voice of god comes and challenges the things you believe it's always good news you don't have to be afraid it's always good news yeah i know that your church you would definitely know jeremiah 29 11. Let's read it. But I'm going to say something more about this particular verse. Because it says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. This is a great verse. But this message comes to Israel, the people of Israel. In a situation where they just have had to leave their roots. They're in exile in Babylon. And they are, if you read the whole chapter and the chapters before, you can see that they are longing after Jerusalem, where they come from. Where they had the temple, they had their Jewish culture, they had their roots, they had their childhood, they had their upbringing, they had their, you know, all the cultural items. Everything they knew was from Jerusalem. And now they are in this strange place, Babylon, where they, they, they are even taken captive and false prophets come, come forward. And, this, and they prophesy this, it sounds really spiritual and great. They say, oh, you're going to return to Jerusalem. Within two years, you will be back in your home. But God comes and tells the truth and says, no, that's a lie. You are going to stay in Babylon. And you're going to be a blessing to the city. And it's in this context 
that Jeremiah 29, 11 comes. It's a comforting message for those who are in a strange place. It's a message that, okay, maybe you are in some place you don't recognize. Maybe you want to leave these new discoveries, this new excitement, this new adventure. And you want to go back to the old stuff, the way you used to do it, the way you used to think. And then the message of God comes with confidence and says, no, move onwards because the future I have for you is good. Don't be afraid. That's the context of that verse. They are in exile. They're afraid. They're, they, are, they feel alienated from their surroundings. And God says, no, hang around. Stay here. Be a blessing because I have a good future for you. So if you're being pulled by something, a place you used to be and the place you are now or the place you are heading, I have a very simple message here in point number one. Just trust the Lord that his future is good. Don't return back to whatever. You know, Peter, the disciple Peter, after walking with Jesus for three years, seen amazing things. He's seen healings. He's seen, you know, the dead resurrect. He's seen tremendous things. He sat under the teaching of Jesus for three years. And then Jesus does everything that he said he would do. He dies on the cross. He resurrects. And then he ascends to heaven. Okay? You know the story <laughs> as a Christian. But you know what happens when Jesus has ascended to heaven? You know, Peter now is really confused. Do you know what he does? You would imagine that he would do everything Jesus said. He would go out, out into the world and preach the gospel. No. Do you know what he does? He returns to fishing. I love the Bible verse. If you're looking at the notes screen guide, just look at the way the last verse I have in, in, in the whole presentation. The last verse. It's a really slow, it's a, it's a short verse where it says, John told the other disciples, I'm going fishing. It's a really, really deep Bible verse. I'm going fishing. The other disciples told him, we are, no, not that one. It's, uh, it's, it doesn't matter. Anyway, Peter, he, says, he tells the other disciples, I'm going fishing. And it's like the other disciples, they are being influenced by him. And they say, yeah, we'll join you. So this whole group of disciples, after walking around with Jesus for three years, what do they do? They're, I mean, they're moving into the future. They're going to found the first early Christian church. They're, you know, they've been hearing that Jesus, they were going to do the same miracles, the same wonders. They were going to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all people of all mankind. And what do they do? They return to fishing, their old profession. Why? Because they're in this land between. They know what they have left, but they don't know what's coming. It's like Israel leaving Egypt, you know. They know what they left behind. Slavery, you know, oppression, Pharaoh, and all these things. Chains, hard work. They know what's behind, but they don't understand the promise of what's ahead. And what do they do? They start longing after what used to be. They have these different voices. They have the voice of promise, the voice of future, but they have the voice of the past, and they just... They just want to go back to something that's secure, something that's safe. Okay, these are chains, this is slavery, but at least we know what it is. But the problem is they don't trust God's promise. That's why God is so obsessed in explaining, trust me that I'm good. You must understand I'm good. The future is better. It's better. Move ahead. Amen? You know, God, He loves, God loves people who are in these seasons. It's a vulnerable season to be in between. You know what's behind you, but you're not sure what's ahead. You know, the truth with, uh, with the church, the, uh, the Jabba the Hutt story, is that the, it ended with a real, you know, we just trusted the Lord uh, in this season. And uh, suddenly, in a, in a very special moment, a special couple of days, the conviction, the voice of God was so clear and so obvious. And we responded and we actually started the whole thing by planting another campus. And then we took it on, and I mean, it's still lots of challenges, lots of hard work, but we are, you know, 100% uh, convinced and, and uh, you know, responded to the calling of God. And I'm just so glad I didn't return to something old. I'm so glad in this season I didn't know what was ahead. I knew what was behind. I'm just so glad I didn't run away from that destiny, although it was, you know, unsure. It was a little bit fragile, a little bit dangerous. But people, God loves people in this season. You know, God, He loves doubters because God does things for people who are doubting and faltering that He does for nobody else. And I believe, and Katrina, she can, she can confirm 
that this is not, I, I don't say, I don't make promises to people every morning. God is going to change everything today. But I really believe this morning that God will speak to someone who came here doubting. Being pulled between different directions. Being tempted to go back to your old thinking, your old ways. And God is going to actually confirm something because God loves to speak to the doubters. You know, in John 20, 25, that was the verse we were looking at. You know, uh, the disciple Thomas, I don't know how it is in English, but in Norwegian, we, he has get this title, Thomas the Doubter. Do you call him the same? We call him Thomas the Doubter. That's why when I grew up, because my name is Thomas, you know, a lot of these pastors, they called me not Thomas the Doubter, but Thomas A.P., which meant Thomas after Pentecost, <laughs> after he got spirit-filled. So actually, even today, when I meet some of these old, you know, pastors that used to be around, uh, and they're, ah, oh, Thomas A.P., Thomas after Pentecost. He's not the doubter, he's after Pentecost. Anyway, let's, let's look at this. So the other disciples told Thomas, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my hands into his side, I will never believe. So he's a doubter. He's being pulled in two different directions. And I love Jesus, the response of Jesus. Because does Jesus punish Thomas for doubting, for his unbelief? No. Jesus does things for the unbeliever that he does for nobody else. He loves to prove himself for those who are, you know, wavering, who are pulled in two different directions. Actually, what Jesus does is that he lets Thomas touch his wounds. And touch his body and touch the, he, he looks at the wounds in his, in his feet and his hands. And you know, remember, just, just as, a, as a, you know, footnote, this is a bunch of guys, the disciples. And if there's anything us guys love, it's to show each other wound. It's, it's like, you know, if you have gone paintballing with a group of guys, it's not about who won, but to show the biggest marks, you know. Hey, look at this, look at this, look at this. We've been impressed by each other marks, you know. And, you know, even as kids, you know, the girls, they get hurt and they just are quiet about it. Us guys, they look, hey, look at my leg. Look at this. Look at this. I'm hurt. I'm hurt. So we love to look at each other, you know, blood and stuff and all that. And I'm not saying that that's what Jesus did with his disciples. But this is a bunch of guys. And Thomas was the one who got to come really close. He didn't go to the other 11 disciples and let them touch the wounds. He does it only for Thomas. Why? Because he loves to prove himself to the doubter. He loves to convince. That's why, like you read before, he's the good shepherd with the 99 righteous. But still, who does he go after? The one lost. He loves the one who is doubting. He loves the one who, is, who has gone astray. It's just God's heart. And the 99 righteous, they could stand there and go, oh, the shepherd has never gone, been that personal with me. No, but Jesus says, oh, you are, you are here all the time. I love you. You are home. But I'm going after the one who's, who's gone away. It's the same with the prodigal son. God loves to prove himself to the one. So when the prodigal son comes home, what does God do? Or the father, which is the image of God, he throws a party. He loves to celebrate the doubter. And the elder brother who was home all the time, he goes, huh, you never threw me a party. And you can just hear the, the heart of God when God says, hey, you know, you're with me all the time. You can have a party whenever you want. You got all the rights. You got all the benefits of the house. But now my son who was lost, he has come home. I'm going to give attention to him. And I'm not going to excuse myself for it. Actually, you better get along or you're actually going to be in trouble. So let's party because God's heart reaches after the one who is lost. The one who is doubting. He does things for the one. Even the, dis the disciples in the boat, you know. When it's a big storm. What do the, how do the disciples react? They're being really afraid. You would think after walking around with Jesus for a long time, they would have faith. They would go, oh, we're in the boat. It's stormy. It's, you know, it looks like as if we're sinking. But we're with Jesus. We're fine. No, they get really scared. And they even accuse Jesus and say, Jesus, don't you care? What's the matter with you? You're asleep in this boat. Can't you see we're going under? And you know, Jesus, he does rebuke them a little bit. He does actually, but what does he do next? He comes to storm. He does think for the doubter that he does for nobody else. Maybe if they were believing, maybe Jesus didn't even have to come to storm. Because when you, when you reach this level of faith and you're so rooted in Christ and you're so in, in the comfort you have in him, you can even, you know, sail through the storm. And you know, as long as I'm close to Jesus, it's okay, it storms. But if you're insecure, if you're afraid, you know, 
we could say that, yeah, that's, that's dangerous to be insecure. It's dangerous to doubt. But you know, I believe Jesus' heart is going specially for you. He will calm the storm for you. A storm he didn't come for somebody else. Because he loves to prove himself to you. He loves to convince you. Amen. So let me move very quickly. That number two and three will not be as long. But number two. The voice is in Herod's life. He's being pulled between the voice of insult and the voice of grace. And this is another big di distraction for Herod. It's the voice of insult. Because Herod, Herod himself, he was not insulted by John the Baptist. I mean, actually, the text says that he has a lot of respect for him. He knew that he was a righteous man, a holy man. But his wife, I'm not sure how the English pronunciation is, but is it Herodias? Herodias. So his wife, Herodias, she is really bitter towards John. And remember, Herod, he's not bitter. He's listening to John. He loves John. But his wife is bitter. You know, sometimes the most distracting voice from the voice of God is not your own insult. It's the insult you take on on behalf of somebody else. For Herod, it's a tragedy. You know, sometimes it, it's, in a way, it's easy to deal with our own bitterness. Yeah, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's, it's like, because we're not, nobody wants to, you know, present themselves as a victim and say, hey, I'm bitter. You know, very few people will, will raise their hand and say that I'm, I'm a bitter person. But you know what we will do? We will take somebody else's bitterness and we will represent them, which suddenly makes us not victims, but heroes. Because not, now I'm not a victim of bitterness. I'm actually a, a hero rescuing this guy. And, for, uh, and it's a tragic story because for, for the daughter as well, what does she do? I mean, she's just innocent in this. She dances. And what does she do? She goes to her mom and obviously there's, a, there's, an, a, you know, there's an attachment there that maybe is not even healthy. So the mother uses and abuses her trust. She takes her insult, her bitterness, and forces her daughter to do something she would never do otherwise. She has no reason to be bitter towards John. But, you know, that's what bitter and insulted people will do. They will use you. They will use your trust and they will use your love. They will say, are oh, you love and care for me? Hey, listen, I'm really angry with these guys. If you love me, you'll be angry with them too. It's so dangerous and it's such a strong voice that will pull you away from the voice of God. And for Herod, this story ends. In a bad way, you know. For Actually, it's, it's not a tragic story for John the Baptist. He dies like a hero. But for Herod, it's a tragedy. And actually, if you read, you know, historical documents, only a few years later, he dies isolated, alone, being rejected by his own family. He's being pulled out of office. He dies alone, isolated, and lonely, and totally rejected, and, you know, um, taking away all honor. That's how he dies. So it's a, I'm not here this morning in Wales to give you a, Give you a sad story. But that is the consequence of taking on somebody else's bitterness. Because Herod, he, he takes Herodias' bitterness and uses her bitterness, her insult, and becomes like a representative and demands the head of John the Baptist. But he's pulled in different directions. There are some here this morning, you're being pulled by your own heart, which is maybe glad. It's excited. It's full of faith, full of future, full of promise. You're connected to the church. You're connected to ministry. You want to grow in life. You want to grow in Christ. You want to maybe even serve more in church. You want to give more. You want to see more fruit in your life. But you're being pulled by the voices of other people's insult, not your own. And it's like, oh, should I be a hero and represent them? No, you just be gracious towards everyone. And then you make sure that you protect your own heart from letting the voice of somebody else's insult pull you away from the voice of God. The third and the last. The two voices, maybe the strongest ones actually, it's God's love versus people's approval. Because this is again Herod's tragedy. It's that he would not lose face in front of this company of leaders. You know, I honestly believe that it is not hard and difficult to follow God's voice. It's not so complicated. Sometimes we present, you know, yeah, obeying God, it's this, you know, really big price to pay. No, sometimes the reason why the price is so big is because we are so dependent on other people's approval. So it becomes costly for us because we think we risk something, you know. I believe that God's voice is always full of promise. It's full of future. But one of the key distractions is the voice of 
approval. And that's the reason we feel that there's so much risk in following God's voice. We think, what will people think? What kind of box will these people put me into? If I respond to the calling that I have, if I respond to the things that I believe God has put on my heart, what will these guys think? How will they respond? What will those insulted people think about me? Now they will reject me. You know, people's approval is what makes it difficult sometimes. But I'll tell you one thing. You know, approval, confirmation must come from someone with authority to give it. Someone of significance. I will explain. Just listen a few more minutes. You know, for us people, it, it's, it's for everyone. It's, it's not always about how many people like me, but it's about who likes me. For young people sometimes, it's not just comforting to know, yeah, I was invited to parties. But it's which party was I invited to. It's not just that someone approves of me, but who approved of me. You know, I know people who have hundreds of friends, young people. They are popular. They got, you know, their, their pictures on Instagram. They're being overwhelmed by likes. But still they struggle so much with rejection because this one person, maybe a father, maybe a sister, maybe someone of big significance, rejected them or hurt them. And they struggle with rejection their whole life. Oh, they, got, they got many people. You see, we need this one voice of confirmation and approval. You know, when I chased Katrina, I chased her for 10 years trying to win her heart. I did. She listened to God's voice in the end. You know, I did all these weird things. Actually, I put a postcard in her mailbox that said, hello, are you one of Job's daughters? Because it says in the Bible, Job's daughters was the most beautiful in the land. So I put that, yeah, and f yeah, it's cute, but unfortunately she'd never heard of neither Job nor her, his daughters, so it didn't work. <laughs> but you know, when I chased Katrina, it was, it was her approval it was her attention i was after you know it didn't matter with the hundreds of other girls lining up to say you know no it wasn't hundreds it was two one of them was my mom anyway it was katrina's attention i wanted it was her because that was the one you know love the one person that was of significance of authority you know love is relevant when the one who loves is someone of significance and with authority to give it. You know, if I jump into a Welsh courtroom and I jump in the courtroom and I say, hey, the defendant is not guilty, he's free. I mean, for the, I mean, for the defendant, it's, it's, I mean, it's nice, it's flattering, oh, someone supports me, but it doesn't help me because he has no authority in this courtroom. He can say how much he likes that he wants me to be free. But there's actually one person who has the authority to free me. And that must be the same person who also has the authority to judge me. Listen, if people understood that one like from heaven means more than a million likes from men, it would change our destiny. Because God, he's the one person. He is the one person, and listen, especially for those who don't believe in Jesus, and you think, no, I don't want to be a Christian. I don't like this God being a judge thing. Well, God being the judge, that is our absolutely only hope. Because it's only the one with authority to judge is the one who has authority to free. And you know, that's why the Bible says this, the, the one who is being set free by the Son, he's free indeed. Because the one with authority to judge you, he set you free. He declared you not guilty. He declared the punishment is taken. You're forgiven. You're free. And you know, if you understand the authority of that voice, you know, for some people, when they hear God is a judge, they get afraid. But you know, for someone who's seen the gospel, when you hear that God is a judge, you know, you feel relief. Yeah, he's a judge, all right. But the one with authority to judge, he Pull this, I don't know how to say this in, in, in English, but you know, you have this hammer, you know, and you say, the, not guilty. And he did that for me. He said, actually, he's not even the judge, not, not only the judge, he's also my lawyer. So he defended me and he judged me and said, not guilty. And great defense, by the way. You see, that is, that when you get the authority of that voice, imagine the future of Herod. If he understood that this, the approval of this company didn't mean anything. These military leaders, 
this financial elite, you know, all the people that he looked out at when, when the daughter came and said, I want the head of John the Baptist. And then he felt in his heart, he felt sorrow. He really didn't want to do it. But then he looked at the crowd and he said, oh, I cannot lose face in front of these people. I am dependent on their approval. Imagine if, if Herod stood up and said, no, I will not do it. Imagine if he responded to this new voice that challenged his belief system, a voice of grace, a vo voice of forgiveness, a voice of love. What kind of king would he be in history if he was the one to turn the, his whole Herod dynasty history around? Imagine if he was, the, he was the one to end that curse that was over that family just with all the drama, all the confusion, all the tension that he would be the one. No, there's a new voice now in our generation. There's a new voice in my family. Imagine he would have been a hero. And that's not the point that he would have been a hero, but his dependency on approval pulled him away from the voice of God. You know, it's not hard to follow the voice of God. It's really easy because God's voice is good. It's always full of promise. Actually, Jesus says that my burden is light. It's easy to carry. But the reason it becomes so heavy is that we're afraid for people's approval. But if you understand that the one with authority to give approval, he loves you, he's for you, he's on your side, then you can pull away. You know, when I came, you can pull away from the dependency of people's approval. Let's get, uh, let's get uh, at least a couple of musicians or a keyboardist up here. You know, when I came home from Bible school in 1999, I was 19 years old. Okay, I actually went to Australia before it was even called Hillsong. It was called Hills Christian Life Center. I went to this Bible, to their Bible college. And I had a life-changing year. But when I got home, I had some of my closest friends, you know, uh, four or five of my really closest friends I used to have lots of fun with. We used to do crazy things. I will not tell about it now. <laughs> but I love them and they love me. But when I got back home, uh, all of my closest friends, they had pulled away from church. And I don't think they were rebellious or anything. They just got into other circles and got other voices, other influences. So when I got back home, I looked at this and I, I listened to them. This was, my, this was my relationships, you know. And I stood in this decision that now I have to choose. Either I have to go with them and have friends or I have to go with God and the things God has put on my life and, and feel lonely for a while. And honestly, it was not a difficult choice for me. But I've seen so many people in this choice. It's like you're being pulled by different voices. You want to go with God. You know that's the only way. You know it's your only hope. It's your only foundation. But maybe your friends have made this decision. And these people have done this decision. And these people are pulling away from church. And it's like, well, I don't want to be lonely. You know, for some people they say, I'd rather, be, I'd rather have friends without God than being lonely with God. But the truth is this. If you understand the power of His approval, for me it was not difficult. I went with God. I did not ask my friends, what are you going to do? And then I followed them. I said, I'm going after Jesus and you can follow if you want. And I did that. And to be honest, I'm not trying to bolster anything, but it was not difficult. I just knew this is the only way. I was lonely for a season. It was really lonely. All my friends that left. So I was by myself. But I knew that you will never lose. You will never become second by putting God first. And I knew that this is the destiny. And you know... It was only a short season I was lonely, and then I got some of the, now I have so many friends, I, it's, it's too many. <laughs> you know, and now it's great. We have so many good people in our lives, you know, so we're not lonely anymore, and God rewarded that. You know, let me close by this, with this idea. You know, trusting God, it's sometimes like being in an airport terminal. I love these airports, where you have all these gates, you know. So you have gate 19, New York. Gate 20, Bangkok. Gate 21, Tokyo. Gate 22, Los Angeles. Have you been to any of those airports? You know, it's, it's not like New York is behind that door, you know? It's not if you open door 90, ah, oh, look, Manhattan, nice. And then if you open gate 20, ah, oh, look, Los Angeles, beautiful, that's Hollywood. And then, you know, oh, Tokyo, no, the city is not behind that door. But going into that gate will start a journey that ends up in New York. So when you are in this terminal, it might look like a very small, insignificant choice. I'm going to go 20 meters this way to gate 19. 
It's not a big thing. But if I walk just 20 meters over here to get 20, it ends up in two completely different destinations. And you know, sometimes these choices, it's not the big, it's not two big cities ahead of you. Oh, New York, Los Angeles, who am I gonna choose? No, sometimes it's just this simple, small decision to move towards God's promise, God's word, God's future, or this small little decision to move, move towards insult, bitterness, my history, my past, I go back to fishing, you know? But it will start a journey that ends up in two completely different destinations. Hey, let's enter the right gate this morning. Let's choose to go into the gate that is full of promise. There, where the word of God is, where God's grace is. Trust his grace. He loves you. You know, Jesus, he has two eyes. He looks at you with grace and faith. One eye is graceful. And he looks at you and he sees through all the bad things that everyone else can see. His other eye is full of faith and it sees all the potential that nobody else can see. Most people, they see what it is and they say, that's bad, that's good. That's negative, that's positive. Jesus sees through all the bad things and he sees potentials that is not even there. The Pharisees, they wanted to stone and judge a woman who was, you know, who was, had committed uh, some kind of sexual immorality. And the, the Pharisees, they saw no future and they did not, they were not graceful towards her past. But Jesus sees her and he, he has grace towards her past, past and then faith towards her future and says go away here's a new direction here's a new gate for you to enter and I, I want us all to enter into that gate that God has prepared for us that we end up in the destination he wants you to be so I actually want to invite you very simply I know we're a little bit over time but let me let me close by inviting you because I would love to as we close in worship I would love to just simply pray for you and just just really enjoy a prophetic atmosphere for a couple of moments, okay? Let's close our eyes in the whole auditorium. I will ask a, a, a couple of questions. And my number one question, I hope everyone's been blessed. I, I really hope. But now my invitation is particularly for those of you who know that you are being pulled in different voices. I'm not just talking about decisions on should I have cheese or ham on my sandwich you know, everyone needs to make decisions. Sometimes we, I would also love to hear more of the voice of God. Now I'm only, I'm inviting you specifically. If you know, you know what I'm talking about. You're being pulled in one direction with the God's word, with God's promise. You're calling things that are on your life and other voices around you that, that is pulling you in another direction. While everyone has their eyes closed. Can I ask if you identify somehow on any level, big or small, with this, I would love to pray for you and just speak blessing over you this morning. Can you lift your hand or just give me a sign? Yeah, there's lots of people. Just keep them raised for just a, a few seconds. Just keep them raised for a few seconds. In the name of Jesus. Oh, I thank you, Father, that your future is full of hope. It's full of promise. And I thank you for the wisdom, the courage, and the confidence to go after your voice this morning. I pray for these people who are pulled even in the marriage. Some people who stand, should I leave her? Should I stay with her? Should I leave him? Should I stay with him? Now I pray this morning that your word, your promise, your grace will just melt hearts and bring them back to reality. Your re reality will bring them back to the point of where they trust you and where they can go after forgiveness, go after the right things. I pray for those people right now who, because their friends are being pulled from church or pulled from the destiny and the calling they have, I pray in the name of Jesus that they would gracefully shut the door to that gate that is leading away from your heart, Lord. And I pray that they would have the courage and the trust to enter into the gate. They know where God is calling and your voice is loud and clear. I pray in the name of Jesus. I pray in the name of Jesus for those who are ready to give up on their promise, give up on their healing, give up on your promises in the word and they think oh I'm going to pull away I'm just going to let it go I pray this morning that they would have the courage to rise up and just stand on your word stand on your promises and continue to go after your voice and listen to your promise in the name of Jesus I pray for them and I pray that your Holy Spirit would, would minister to them right now